The French mathematician Joseph Fourier once said, mathematics compares the most diverse phenomena and discovers the secret analogies that unite them. And if math had sounded that mysterious when I was in school, I might not have ended up a theater kid. <laughs> Luckily here at UCLA, Professor Terence Tao has spent his career helping us all understand how figures and formulas connect us to our universe and to each other. In his classroom, you'll see the beauty of a binomial, find the grace of geometry, and learn how to listen to the music of this universal language. In fact, his colleagues here call him the Mozart of math. And today we're here to talk about the future we're writing with these tools and the harmony or discord that they can create. So please help me welcome James and Carol Collins, Chair and Professor of Mathematics, Terence Tao. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. It's, uh, you know, in these times, we need leadership. Uh, it's more important than ever. So um, yeah, I'll be talking about, well, the whole world is changing, of course, uh, but also uh, mathematics as well. Um, but we are a very traditional bunch. Uh, in many ways, the way we work today is not that different from the way we worked 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, on the left here, we have a memoir by Augustus Cauchy, uh, one of the great mathematicians of the um, 19th century. Uh, it's in French, and it's not typeset of a computer, but uh, to a math graduate student here at UCLA, the textbooks that uh, he or she would learn from are not that much different from this book, which was uh, published exactly 200 years ago. Um, we still use blackboard and chalk. Uh, in fact, we are very particular about what kind of chalk we use. Um, <laughs> we're maybe the on almost the last department that hangs onto them. Um, and uh, over on the right here, we have this uh, coffee table book by uh, Jessica Wynn. She's a photographer. She was fascinated by the, the math we leave on our blackboards, and she actually photographed. She viewed them as works of art, uh, and she photographed them and made a nice little collection. Um, another way in which mathematicians are different, uh, or at least have not caught up to uh, other sciences, is that we still find it hard to collaborate. Um, you know, in, in our, in our uh, in the rest of our division, you know, physics and chemistry, people have worked out how to collaborate with 50 people, 100 people, on Andrea's collaboration, for instance. Uh, but still in math, we struggle to work with, you know, more than five people. Um, and there are reasons. Um, there's a high barrier to entry. Um, I know you're not mathematicians, most of you. You may have noticed, but a lot of math is rather technical, has a bit of jargon. And you, know, you need uh, you know, first high school math, you know, algebra, and then calculus, and then, uh, and then graduate level math to even understand many of the forms we work on. So this, we, you already need a math PhD to even just begin working on many of these projects. Also, we have this very, very high standard of proof. You know, if a proof has 20 steps and one of them is wrong, the whole proof falls apart. Um, so if you collaborate with 20 people and one of them doesn't produce good work, you're in trouble. Um, and our workflows don't scale. I told you we love our blackboards. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, have, we can have three or five people at a blackboard uh, talking back and forth. It's amazing. We can't have 50 people at a blackboard. Um, yeah, so, so we haven't figured out, until recently, we've not figured out how to collaborate the same way that the other sciences have done very successfully. So you know, are we missing out on all this good stuff? Well, things are changing. Um, so thanks, thanks to new technologies and a new culture, actually, uh, new workflows are emerging. Uh, we are beginning to do genuinely large-scale projects. Still not quite as large as the other sciences, but we're going to catch up. If math was a social science, uh, it would be as if, until recently, we could only do case studies. We could take an individual and interview them and, and, uh, and do a fine analysis of one person. But now we can do population surveys. We can start studying thousands and thousands of problems at the same time. We're beginning to broaden participation. Uh, as I said, uh, right now there's so much of a high barrier to entry. Mathematicians mostly talk to other mathematicians. But in other sciences, there are citizen science projects that involve the general public or academics from other disciplines. And we're beginning to have that uh, here at, uh, in mathematics. And uh, we have this fancy new technology of AI and machine learning. Uh, we are still experimenting with how to use it properly. Uh, we know also ways how not to use it. Um, but there are some positive use cases that are a proof of concept. And the secret source that makes all this work is that there's, there's a, um, a technology called formal verification. 
Um, it was developed by computer scientists, but mathematicians have embraced it. Uh, it is uh, specialized computer languages that you can feed in um, things like a mathematical proof. If you, and if you do it in the right language, it will give you a certificate that says this is correct, this is not correct, and it's not correct, where are the errors? Um, and without this, none of the other uh, developments would be possible. So I'll just briefly talk about one project that I started here at UCLA uh, last year. It's called the Equational Theories Project. It is a project in algebra. Now, I don't want to talk about uh, the specifics of algebra, but maybe in your high school algebra classes, you may have heard of the commutative law, x times y equals y times x. You may have heard of the associative law, x times y times z equals x times y times z, if, if you put the brackets the other way. And you can write many, many other laws like that. So uh, what we did was we generated a population of about four or 5,000 laws. Now, in algebra, historically, algebraists study one law at a time. They do a case study. They take one algebraic law, and they study all its consequences very, very uh, thoroughly. But we wanted to do a population survey. We would take 4,000 um, odd laws and ask, how do they interact with each other? Which laws imply which other ones? What is the landscape of algebra? Uh, and because of all the pairs that you could consider, uh, this ended up being 22 million problems that we had to, to, to study. Given 20, two million pairs of laws, which one is stronger than, than another? For example, does the commutative law imply the associative law? Um, now, a graduate student here at UCLA in mathematics, um, a typical problem, they could probably work it out in maybe an hour of pen and paper. Um, but there's 22 million of these problems. And some of them are actually too tricky to do in an, in an hour. Um, there are computers, and computers can handle a fair chunk of these problems at a time, but no computer program can sort of handle all of, all of them. So, there's no way that a single person or a single program can, uh, can, can do this. You have to collaborate. But then there's this other problem that if you have people coming in with 22 million proofs and one of them is wrong, <laughs> you know, your whole project uh, doesn't work. Uh, someone has to grade 22 million proofs. Um, so that is not uh, uh, feasible until, re until recently. Okay. But nevertheless, we, we did this in three months uh, with uh, 50 people. Uh, some at UCLA, uh, some uh, international, most have not, not, not met. Professional mathematicians, computer scientists, people from industry, just members of the general public who like solving puzzles. Uh, we, solved it, uh, we completed it in three months. Um, we had to develop new workflows to do this. There's lots and lots of very diverse um, proofs that are coming in. Some were human generated with pen and paper. Some were computer generated by these things called automated theorem provers. Uh, the very, very early versions of AI, think of it like that. Um, and then we had these chat rooms on the internet where we would, we would try to collate them and figure out how to convert them to this proof assistant language, it's called Lean, that verifies um, um, all, these, um, uh, all these inputs. And then we had, someone had to develop visual, visualization tools to see uh, what portion of our implication landscape was still missing and, and what needed to be done. And we had to direct, and that had to loop back to all the other, um, to all the other collaborators. Um, it was a really, really fun project to work on, actually. Um, and uh, we're hoping that this is a paradigm for future large-scale collaborations. Okay, so we'll talk about uh, AI. This is the, the technology of the decade. Um, so in principle, it, it, this is a really, really promising technology. Um, and we're already using it somewhat. Um, it's really great for secondary tasks. Um, I can write computer code now to, to simulate all kinds of mathematics. It's so easy uh, with, with, with these tools. It's great. Um, and just recently, they've become useful tools for literature review, uh, which also was a very tedious task in the past. If you feed them the right data sets, um, they can um, generate um, new mathematical conjectures. They can find mathematical patterns. Uh, we have a shortage of good data sets currently, uh, but that's something that we're working on. But to me, the application of AI that's most exciting is that they are a universal translator. Um, the really complicated topics in mathematics can be explained you can ask an AI to explain at the level of a high school student, or you just tell it what, what, what you know, and it will try to, to, to match your language. And conversely, if an amateur mathematician wants to talk to a professional, um, if they use AI, they, in principle, they can, um, they can speak with correct, you know, using, using the, the correct mathematical jargon and in a really comprehensible way. And so I think we can really collaborate with other scientists, with, with members of the general public, in ways that we've not been able to do before. But AI is a very flawed technology. It, is, um, it has many, many issues with it. Um, 
the issue for which concerns mathemat mathematicians the most is that it just makes mistakes, lots and lots of mistakes. Uh, it, um, the modern AI tools are not grounded in reality. They hallucinate all kinds of very plausible looking nonsense. Um, and in maybe in some other fields, this might be acceptable, actually it's problematic everywhere really. But in math, it is, it is particularly bad because of this 100% correctness um, um, requirement in our proofs. Um, but we have these formal proof verifiers that are like, think of them as like extremely fussy graders. Um, that you know, they, will, they, they can take the output of a large language model and, and they can give it a correctness certificate or they can point out the errors. And um, so they can filter out all the bad hallucinations and only keep the small percentage of actual correct statements. And it's only very recently we can experiment with this, um, but the proof of concepts are very um, promising that this, this could be a powerful combination and a way to safely use these AI tools. And I asked an AI to generate an image to illustrate this, uh, this point. So the LM uh, output is this sort of uh, sewage looking kind of mathematics, and then we have this filter to produce drinkable mathematics, I guess. Okay. Um, so uh, just to close, you know, I've been here uh, 29 years, not quite as long as Andrea. Um, at UCLA, but I've, I've always been very grateful at the opportunities here and the, uh, the, the freedom that it's given me to explore new directions. Uh, this, is, this type of work is not what, what I was hired for to do here 29 years ago, but um, you know, I, I very much uh, align with uh, UCLA's ideals, you know, the idea that, that, that diverse communities can come together and talk and produce great things that they could not do on their own, and that's really informed my own research. So thank you very much.